Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Crouch, and this is Policy Talks, brought to you each month by the Williamson Chamber, affectionately known as Williamson, Inc. Uh, I'm still not used to that, Matt. But uh, we uh, are thrilled to be here at Columbia State uh, Community College this morning, uh, the host of this uh, fine event. And um, we look forward to uh, having a crowd on uh, WCTV with the Creed Henderson's crew and uh, on WAKM. Hope, hope everybody is doing well this morning. Our guest this morning is Mr. Ralph Schultz. Ralph is the president and CEO of the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. And they are the, of course, the uh, kind of the nucleus of this uh, metro area in uh, coordinating the growth and the thoughts about growth in Middle Tennessee. And I saw a presentation he gave about a month ago here in uh, Williamson County about the study that they've recently completed uh, uh, about the growth and what they're expecting for the next five years here in Middle Tennessee and how it affects uh, Williamson County. Mr. Ralph, good to have you with us this morning. Uh, Excited to be here this morning. Tell us a little bit about you personally now. How long have you been uh, with the Chamber in Nashville? And uh, how long have you been in Middle Tennessee? Longer than people can count. Uh, I've, been, I've been at the uh, Nashville Area Chamber for 15 years. Have enjoyed working with Williamson, Inc. and Matt um, as we partner on economic growth. And, of course, Williamson County is an epicenter of that growth, that economic opportunity, that economic growth. So Williamson County has been a very important component of advancing quality of life, standard of living uh, in this area. And we just love our partnership with Williamson, Inc. Well, we appreciate you coming down and uh, taking the time to come down and share with us uh, the study that uh, you're, you've got with you this morning. Uh, I'm going to let you tell us a little bit about the study, what, uh, why you're doing it, uh, and uh, well, we took a uh, we took a trip to Toronto with community leaders from around the region a number of years ago, and one of the things we found was that they conducted a study, a combination of research and survey of the uh, of the population, that was very helpful to them in recalibrating their priorities and their needs as a community, as an economic entity. So we came back to Nashville and we initiated the creation of the Vital Signs document that you're going to see. Now that Vital Signs document is a one-year snapshot and it is based on research that we do and is based on surveying that we do to identify the priorities particularly in the next year, but often this identifies priorities that are multi-year uh, requirements as well. So that's where Vital Signs came from. It is a partnership with GNRC, the Greater Nashville Regional Council. It is a partnership with transportation departments at the state and the local level. It's a partnership with our local partners and our uh, regional partners. And so it is... Um, it's just an indicator. It's another part of the, the data set. If you're watching this on Channel 3, you should be able to see the PowerPoint uh, presentation that we have here this morning, or if you're watching the live stream, so just uh, stay with us. Well, I'll move through it pretty quickly, and I know we're going to make this more of a conversation, so feel free to interrupt with questions. And I'll be bringing some updates to this information as well. Um, as we as we go. So these are the people that we rely on for the financial support to conduct this study every year. And what we found in the uh, in vital signs this year that we're presenting to you is that these four items are the key items that both the population and the research says we need to be addressing uh, moving forward. Uh, to maintain quality of life and to maintain uh, the standard of living in this area. Keep in mind that when we talk about the economic growth that's taking place across this region, and we'll be focused mostly on this MSA, um, which is 13 counties, 
we know from an economic development perspective that the first thing you have to have is a quality of life that's appealing to the population. And then secondly, you need to have the talent availability for the work or the job creators to be able to tap into. And when you have those two things working uh, in the best possible way, then you're going to see job growth and you're going to see job creation. And we view that as economic expansion. So these four things are what we've identified as key priorities to maintaining that pipeline of uh, job creation and economic expansion. You'll see on the far right a little bit of data about Williamson County in these key areas. I'll let that, that sit here for a second. Uh, the median home value of 488,000 is actually continuing to climb. Uh, compare that to the Nashville MSA where you see a median home value of 285,000 and you identify one of the key pressures on economic growth in this area. We're starting to see developers creating uh, more minimal housing. For instance, we visited a, a, a uh, project in Nashville the other day that almost has a dorm room feel to it, where the fundamentals and basics of shelter are being provided at a rate of $1,000 a month on rental, uh, but it it, it is also built on the thought that the younger population that is entering this area is as interested in their community engagement, therefore being outside their home and involved in the community, but it also creates some affordability there too. So you can see all of these things. The education attainment has actually risen uh, over the years in this area, and it has a lot to do with the fact that we might have 25 to 35,000 people entering this region, uh, mostly young and mostly educated as they, as they enter this area. Um, the COVID impacts on employment, as we went through the, shut, the quarantine, and as we navigated that area of that one month statewide economic uh, shutdown, you can see that the, um, the number of jobs that were lost, but you can also see the rapid recovery that occurred in this Middle Tennessee area. Uh, the remaining jobs that haven't been recovered are mostly connected to the hospitality sector. Uh, when we did, our radio audience, if you will, hit the high spots there, if you will. Okay. In, uh, from February 2020 to April 2020, there were 142,000 jobs lost in this region. And from April 2020 to present, they, we have recovered 125,000 jobs. In fact, by the latest count now, we're only 10,000 jobs away from being at those, cre those pre-COVID levels. There is pressure uh, that has been created in this marketplace, in this region, because of the number of people that aren't returning to work. Our labor participation, for instance, which is the total of number of, of people between the ages of 18 and, and higher that are available to work that could be working, 61% of that population is working right now. Pre-COVID, we were we had 68% of the population, that population working. So that difference of 7% in the workforce is creating a crunch for employers. And right now, uh, the, the boomer retirements, the lower birth rates, are all combining to say we're going to have that workforce shortage well into the future, which drives a strategy for places like Columbia State to be a part of upskilling and reskilling and helping people match their skills to the jobs that are going to be available going in the future. Very interesting. The um, uh, you you say that uh, the of all those 142,000 jobs that were lost, do you know how many of those were in Williamson County versus the metro area? I do not have that information. Matt, you don't have? Okay, just curious. Yeah. 
But it's safe to say the jobs that were lost have pretty much come back. <laughs> the, um, as we move into this next slide, emerging from the, the pandemic, Nashville was one of those leaders. This region was one of those leaders in, um, in, in restoring the economy as quickly as possible. Um, when you look at the five most favorably ranked cities, according to uh, a model of forecasting that we saw uh, early in the, re in the recovery, uh, Boston, Washington, D.C., Nashville, Columbus, and San, and San Jose were the areas that led the way in, um, in continuing to grow. We have now seen, well, as a for instance, and I'm looking at some other data that I brought along with me, um, we're one of the top 10 cities for not only recovery, but in 2019 to 2020, during COVID, uh, we actually grew more jobs than we had in the year before COVID. So there are two things I would say to people about our, our performance, population, jobs, et cetera. Number one, I think people are going to be surprised to find out how much our economy grew during COVID and how much our population grew. And if we ever get back to the point where everyone's going back to work again in their office, which is highly unlikely, highly unlikely uh, people would feel that in the transportation sector, which means transportation infrastructure continues to be key. Now, some of the notes I was seeing in the study itself, which I was fortunate enough to get a copy of uh, last week, but uh, it said that uh, between July 2020, July 2021, the area had a net gain in jobs of 70,000. Right. In one year, 70,000 new jobs right in the middle of COVID. We, we expect in the next five years, keep in mind that for the 30 years from 1990 to 2020, the jobs increased by 530,000 in this region for over 30 years, 530,000. In the next five years, we expect those jobs to grow by 224,000. Hmm. We only expect the population to grow 200,000. So you can see again, there's going to be real strain on workforce, real strain on workforce. Well, if, if, if things pick up, uh, after COVID, that 70,000 a year works out to a little more than 235,000, so. Yeah, so it, it is, it, it, we're in a boom time. Yeah. Joe, you got a question. I, I do. <clears throat> is the increase in job growth that you're seeing or projecting uh, due uh, to uh, corporate relocations to Middle Tennessee, or is it organic growth, existing companies just adding jobs? About 80% of the growth is expansions of jobs in this area. Uh, when you look at the Oracle project, it's a good example of the way th these things go. They're bringing 8,500 jobs to this area, but there are another 11,000 jobs that will grow as a result of those 8,500 jobs. Uh, 8,500 jobs that they're bringing. So um, about 80% of the growth is really expansion in this area, which brings to mind, again, from a workforce and a population perspective, there are three ways that employers get workforce. One of those is retention of talent in this area. The second is the in-migration of talent to the area. And the third is the pipeline development of talent in this area. And right now, retention is strong because quality of life is strong, despite the housing affordability pressures in the area. In migration, we're running 25 to 35,000 new people into this region every year, and we expect that number to grow to 40,000 a year. The pipeline is strong and promising at the, at the higher end. That is Tennessee Promise, uh, the reskilling, the community colleges, TCATs, apprenticeships, certification programs. They're all helping to create a workforce that fits the need, but we still have work to do in some areas on pre-K-12 uh, 
education. So the pipeline is the area where we need the greatest work. In migration is strong and retention is strong because quality of life has remained positive. Great. Okay, I'm not moving these very fast. <laughs> Child care has has risen to the top one of the top three priorities. When we look at that labor force participation, there is a higher concentration of women not returning to the workforce, partially because they have taken on a lot of the child care duties in a, a household. COVID did a real job on child care facilities. They closed down, the barriers to entry are high, the restoration of child care facilities is difficult, I think you're going to see the state and some local agencies beginning to impact that with investment. But the truth of the matter is child care has become one of the largest barriers to implementing or engaging that full workforce population again or that labor uh, participation uh, issue again. You can see here that there are people that are really stressed in their household income and in their ability to return to work because of the lack of availability to child care. 50.7% of the surveyed respondents said child care is affecting their ability to work. One of the things that um, I saw in the report that ties into this as well as uh, several of the other things you're going to talk about is it's all about quality of life. In other words, if you want workers here in Middle Tennessee to fill all these jobs, you've got to be able to provide a quality of life of which child care, affordable and dependable child care, is a pretty significant uh, piece of that for, as you say, 50% of the workers out there. In some of the surveying and polling that we've done, if you remember the old adage uh, that we work to live as compared to live to work, um, COVID really underlined for a lot of people that working to live aspect of that, of that adage. And so quality of life is really important. And if quality of life is really important, housing affordability, the presence of infrastructure, particularly transportation infrastructure, child care and education, those are the four things people are looking at the most in terms of that quality of life uh, formula. Fill us in on the rest of them then. Okay. Uh, transportation. Look, we had an issue with mobility across this region uh, before COVID. We're going to continue to have uh, issues with transportation. Uh, Williamson County is particularly strong in working in, part in particularly the South Corridor development and the development of transportation uh, in the county. But there are large issues for the entire region in terms of maintaining uh, mobility. A lot happening there in, uh, the, in, as we've seen with the creation of the Ford plant in West Tennessee, you know, electric vehicles are going to make a big difference going into the future. Uh, building the infrastructure to support that transition will continue to be key. The creation of transit, uh, very important. But mobility is increasingly important as housing affordability becomes more of a challenge and people have to live more remotely from where they work having the mobility to get back and forth to those jobs is a big issue for employers. We all know that uh, transit is very expensive and the uh, city of Nashville tried to pass a, uh, a local ordinance to provide more transit options in Nashville that did not pass, what, three years ago. But um, the infrastructure bill that this Congress just passed, will that accelerate any of this for Middle Tennessee, or do we know yet? Well, I don't think we know yet, but when you look at the structure of that funding as it's being distributed around the United States, there's a lot of emphasis in that spending on um, maintaining or fixing existing infrastructure. So 
For cities that have existing transit systems, such as New York City with a subway system or LA, or you look at the interstate, interstate uh, system, you're gonna see a lot of investment of that federal money in maintaining those existing uh, uh, transit programs. There's campaigning, there's planning, there is lobbying, there's work being done to try to uh, draw that money as much as possible to Middle Tennessee for new projects. But, you know, the primary focus, if you look at the, at the legislation, is really to help those areas that have existing uh, uh, mobility issues maintain that infrastructure. Okay. Um, again, I'm flying through this information, and this is something we kind of experience all the time. But vital signs, the 2020 survey revealed that 72% of the respondents um, said that it is extremely important, is very or extremely important for regional leaders to offer a transit plan with a strategy for funding. A lot of moving uh, parts you know, no pun intended, in this in, in that transit planning. But GNRC, uh, county governments, local governments, the mayor's caucus and the mayors are all pretty focused on this, uh, on this mobility work. While it's true that the, uh, that the, um, the transit referendum failed in Nashville to create that that beginning center of a regional transit system that hasn't stopped people from continuing to work on planning. TDOT very involved there as well. But praise to Williamson County. Williamson County has been very focused on finding solutions, particularly for Williamson County, but for solutions that will work within that regional context. Housing. 21% uh, of Williamson County residents are considered housing cost burdened. And you can see what that means, that they spend over 30% of their household income on their mortgage or rent. That's actually a lower number than in the rest of the region. Um, that, that housing cost burden number has grown as our economy has grown in this area. And part of the driver in that is the fact that for a long time, Nashville had aging housing stock that was available at a lower cost and residents might go in and improve as they lived in that, in that housing. And what's been happening now across the region is that old stock's being knocked down and rebuilt with brand new stuff, and it's a lot more expensive. Right. Did you have? Well, the the constant drumbeat we've heard for 20, 25 years is about the problem of affordable, uh, or what the, we now call work, workforce housing. But as you point out, um, and we were talking before we went on the air, um, the growth has done a lot of things for Middle Tennessee, but it's also pushed the cost of housing up significantly just over the past year, which is exacerbating the problem that the, the service workers particularly have in uh, finding affordable housing. So um, as you put it earlier, you know, we've, we're like the dog that, that caught the car now. What do we do? We've got growth, but how do we handle the, the housing problem? What's the, what's the chamber's answer to that? Well, it's a supply issue. Uh, that's the main, the main issue. We've, we've actually been using some of our recruiting techniques aimed at home builders. But the truth of the matter is there are a lot of good businesses here that are ready to build homes. The supply chain shortage has really inhibited the rapid expansion of, of housing in this area. I was talking earlier about the fact that we know a home builder who has 71 units, they have the money, they have the land, they have the workers, and they don't have the windows. And so they can't build those houses. What 
they might be able to accomplish in a year with those 71 units is now taking them, at least presently, is taking them 18 months to two years. So the, the, the other truth is that the marketplace is going to solve this. This is not going to be... The, government cannot resolve this issue by policy alone. There are some elements of policy that are beneficial, as a, for instance, uh, creating development opportunities on arterial um, uh, roadways that include provisions for affordable housing within those developments is one way to incent developers to undertake affordable housing. But the truth of the matter is that until we get that supply back up to an, an appropriate level, um, we're not going to see a reduction in those in those housing costs. And transportation is really key. I mean, the mobility and the connection, not everyone's going to be able to live close to where their work is. Not everyone's going to be able to function remotely in their job as well. So building that transportation infrastructure and encouraging housing supply are the answers. I was going to wait until after we kind of went through the presentation to, to ask this question. but We're almost there. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, we can. Uh, no, go well, ahead. Go ahead. I've got a lot of questions about transportation. I was trying to be uh, respectful of your time here, but uh, the going back to the effort in Nashville, and you all were uh, the chamber was heavily involved in the effort to uh, uh, pass an ordinance in Nashville. To, You're looking at the face of defeat right but, here. Uh, <laughs> it didn't. Uh, it didn't happen. The mayor had some political problems right in the midst of it, which didn't help. We realized that. But what would you do different if you were? To, um, well, you're you're going to have to do that again uh, if you're going to provide transit in this in this region. You know, about forty percent of all the jobs that are created from relocations and and new businesses in this area occur within that Davidson County space, um, and so that is going to continue to make transportation and that hub of work a very important component to resolving the the transportation issue. I think. Uh, we did have some unexpected challenges with the uh, with the last election, but what it really underlined was that uh, the voters uh, the voters didn't, in the end, trust that government was capable of delivering that size of project for that amount of money to the specifications that had been promised. Now, no question that a lot of people were affected by a change in leadership. The, the primary visionary and the primary leader that was putting that plan forward um, left the scene. Um, but it did uncover a distrust of government to be able to deliver that project. So since that time, there's been a lot of work by many organizations in the Nashville area, in this region, to help build more of a grassroots conversation around what those solutions might be and what the benefits might be. I think the next time we get to a referendum, we're going to find that there are a lot more people better informed as to what the options are, and they will feel that they have participated much more in the discussion of the solution. That's probably the biggest change. Now, the mayor um, has recently formed a Department of Transportation for the city of Nashville. Mm -hmm. And he recently hired a person to come in and... A. DeMassimo. Tell us about the person. He, and say, say the name again. I, well, Faye, Faye DeMassimo has actually been advising the mayor in Nashville um, on, um, on transit remedies and transit solution, transit plans. She came here from Atlanta where she worked heavily on all modes of transportation. Um, from pedestrian and walkways to to rail and 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 bus, um, there is a new Department of Transportation. A new person has been hired to that job, and I am sorry to say that I can't tell you more at this point 
But if we do this again, I'll have that one nailed down. We have worked very closely with Faye, though, um, and continue to do so. And Michael Skipper and GNRC are very engaged, and they're kind of the go-to place uh, for this transit discussion. Right. That's the Greater National Re Re Greater Nashville Regional Council, which they control a lot of the purse strings um, of the federal money that comes into Middle Tennessee. And um, is are we they're, they're an intermediary. They help. They you know they they're kind of an interface between federal funding sources and policy makers in this area. Um, so a lot of funding they manage a process that generates that funding answer. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to uh, okay the slides again. Uh, broadband very important. Uh, very key. We know that, you know, there are even parts of Williamson County, Davidson County, that don't have access to broadband. When we look at some of the solutions in education going forward, when we look at remote work and the availability and the opportunity for work to be conducted from home or other locations, broadband has become an essential staple. So, um, Broadband access is one of those things that was identified in the survey and the research that in our infrastructure we have to start thinking about as infrastructure. So I think you're going to see uh, from the federal government, from state government, Governor Lee is very intense on this particular issue, improvement in our broadband capabilities and, and accessibility, which is going to help workers and it's going to help students. The... Um of course, the COVID um, taught a lot of us we could do more work at home than we thought we could. Uh -huh. um, the uh, uh, I know in in our in the business I'm in, DocuSign has uh, eliminated a lot of those uh, trips to and from the office or to and from a client's house. Uh, unfortunately, their stock's getting killed this morning, but because <laughs> they didn't, they're not doing enough of it apparently. But uh, uh, like I said, we found out we could do a lot more things remotely. Um, that obviously affects the transportation needs. Um, I mean, we fixed the transportation problem in Nashville for a period of time because it, the the traffic disappeared, uh, which is not the way we wanted to fix it. Mm -hmm. uh, but how, how are we seeing that recover? What's the expectation there that... Uh, five years from now, how much work from home are we going to be doing? Um, how is that going to affect the transportation needs? Well, it's a moving target. Um, but, um, but what we're hearing from businesses and developers is that remote work, which comprised about 5% of our work activity before COVID, is likely to double to 10% of our work activity. That's, that's the data that we're hearing from developers and employers that are surveying um, that, ac that activity. We are also seeing businesses accommodate those workforce needs in a couple of different ways. For instance, we're seeing employers that are allowing remote work on a one day a week basis. And by the way, this runs the whole range from 100% remote for a business to no remote work as a business. But we are seeing a, a lot of companies institute an opportunity for remote work maybe one day a week or they're being more relaxed about when you arrive at work. You may work at home remotely for a couple of hours early in the morning and then go into the, uh, go into the office. But there is beginning to be indications that the, the gathering of workers in a place where they work together is an important feature both for the culture of the business and the loyalty of the employer and the loyalty of the employee to the business but also for the mental health. I was talking to somebody last night who told me that, um, first of all, they're starting to see an increase in mental health claims. They've been 100% remote since the beginning of COVID, COVID, and they're starting to see some mental health uh, rise in their, in their health claims. 
But he was also telling me that he has a worker that works full time for them, uh, fully remote, and that worker has taken a job at a pizza place so that he can go out and have contact with people while he works. So, um, you know, I think there's a little bit of a pendulum swing. Look, for us, I, I know we've seen this remote work issue. This is probably the third or fourth cycle I've seen since the 90s where there's kind of a move to, isn't it great to work away from the office? And then eventually people gravitated back. I think we're going to see a little bit of that kind of pendulum, pendulum swing. So it's not going to not going to totally do away with office buildings. Uh, no, in fact, you know, there's no reason to stop building office space. Some of that may be reconfigured uh, depending on what, what, what people are looking for, what businesses are looking for. But um, at the beginning of COVID, I think there was a lot of anxiety about was Nashville already in the process of overbuilt, this region overbuilt an office space and we're not hearing that anxiety anymore. Right. Now, you've, um, your survey also, uh, I think, did a, a survey of just the uh, citizens of what they expect as far as transportation options mm -hmm. uh, going forward. And um, it was pretty well evenly divided between... Um, all the options you could possibly imagine. So the, I honestly don't know where I'm going with this. So <laughs> help, help me out if you, if you uh -huh. see a direction here. But uh, the. Um, we are, go ahead. The, obviously there's a lot from the leadership politically, even here in Williamson County, there is this urgency to embrace transit. Mm -hmm. which obviously means um, mass transit, not single car transit, mm -hmm. like we are used to in Tennessee. Um, and I think the your survey, I don't remember the number, we had it on the slide a few minutes ago, but it was less than 20% of people thought that was the answer. Mm -hmm. um, so if we build transit, what if they don't show up? Well, I think, you know, again, it's a, it's kind of an entire ecosystem of mobility that you have to, that we have to pay attention to, you know, and we've talked about this many, many times, but there is the last mile and the first mile. That is, how do you get to transit options? There are a lot of possible configurations that exist now that didn't exist even when we were talking about the referendum uh, in Nashville. You know, what a lot of this comes down to is the availability of just the square footage, okay? You take a roadway and how you're going to utilize that space and how much capacity can you get out of it. You take uh, sidewalks, you take bikeways. Uh, there are lots of modes that are being embraced, and it all really comes down to how are you going to use that space that you have dedicated to mobility and transit going forward. So as we move down the road or as we, 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 we travel forward with our mobility needs, mass transit will make sense at a later date. It just takes so, so much time to install it that you have to be thinking ahead to preparing for when you need it as compared to looking at this immediate moment and saying, well, we don't need it now, so we don't need it. In, there's no reason to start working on it. And these projects may take 10 to 15 years to, to, to fully undertake. So again, I'll just come back to this point. Everyone will have to be aware of what advantage there is to a mass transit system for them uh, before we're going to get the funding and we're going to get the support from the community to build that mass that mass transit uh, system, it's going to get better than twenty percent. Right. Uh, the uh, 
obviously everybody's got personal opinions and I'm trying not to insert mine here, but uh, the, uh, it's hard. Oh, go for it. It makes the conversation more interesting. <laughs> well, you asked for it. Uh, but let's let Joe, and Joe, last name, please. Jensen. Oh. I'm Joe Jensen. Uh, I live and work in, in Williamson County, specifically in Franklin. In terms of mass transportation, I'm originally from the upper Midwest, where in Chicago they've had subways and trains for 150 years, just about. And so it's, it's a lifestyle issue. And what I, uh, what I th think about with mass transit, and specifically trains or rail, is how do you get people to embrace giving up their car and getting on a train to go to work, whether it's light rail or whatever. And I'm wondering, the Music City Star has now been in operation for 25 years, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, or thereabouts. Do you know the numbers in terms of, of ridership now on the Music City Star as opposed to originally how much it is increased year by year currently? I mean, are people really embracing that? Especially with the growth in Lebanon and, and, and over in Wilson County, Mount Juliet, I would think there'd be a lot of people riding the train, but are there? Well, I, I mean, this COVID year is not a good comparison. But prior to COVID, as businesses like Alliance Bernstein and Amazon and others, now Oracle, but it, with those that had entered the downtown Nashville marketplace, we were seeing an increase in ridership because, to be honest with you, the affordability of housing in, out east in Wilson County made that a very attractive place for in migrating workers to go to for housing so we were seeing i don't have the numbers handy right now we can we we could find those numbers for you but of course when covid hit that all plummeted and even now the the you know we may be talking about 60 percent of the office workers in downtown have returned to office work in the downtown area. State of Tennessee continues to operate largely on a remote basis. So right now that ridership would, would continue to be down. I will mention that uh, my concern about transit, particularly as it relates to Williamson County, is density. You, if you don't have a lot of people, that that is convenient to their home. Um, it's difficult to get them to, to walk very far to a bus stop or to a train stop and that sort of thing. And, and Franklin has um, been on a uh, very quiet uh, path toward uh, raising the number of stories you can build within one mile of I-65. I don't know if you've noticed that, but that's probably a pretty important piece of the puzzle to make it actually work which Lebanon is still mostly one story, uh, Mount Juliet mostly one story, but you're seeing a lot of multi-story buildings going up here in Franklin. And uh, that should help if we ever have a, a transit option between here and downtown Nashville. The, uh, one of the concerns I've got though is that a lot of our uh, staff for uh, for instance, attorney's offices in the complex that I'm that I'm in um, live in Rutherford County, mm -hmm. and so we need <laughs> transit between here and uh, Murfreesboro, between here and Laverne and Smyrna. Uh, yeah, it's not a mistake that Highway 96 is undergoing a change right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's it is certainly going under a huge change, mm -hmm. and uh, so you've got to put all those pieces together. The, back to my personal question, and I, and I asked the mayor here uh, recently, I said, has anybody done a study to see if you stacked a flyway over I-65 with a few more lanes up there, even toll, toll lanes? Um, in other words, if, if you want to go faster, you know, pay a, a couple of bucks and, and get on, on up above the traffic and uh, go all the way to downtown without uh, uh, the slowdown that we're seeing uh, between here and, and, and Nashville uh, many days now. The, 
it'd be expensive to do that. Mm -hmm. Just as it's also expensive to provide a transit option. But the operating expenses of that, it seems to me, would be much lower than a train or a bus system. Yeah, true. I, I just think you have to ask, ask the question, how are people going to resolve their transportation and their mobility needs going forward? I mean, even now, as we see the housing affordability uh, or the cost of housing rising, we're seeing those young, educated in, -migra in migrants to Nashville having to spend more money on housing, spend less money on transportation. You're seeing them walk and, 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 and bike so many more places, and they are looking for housing that puts them in walking uh, distance of all of their essential needs, right? So I think a lot of this is going to be driven by household income, cost, and what's the most efficient way to get the kind of transportation that you need to be able to enjoy the quality of life. And I'll conclude that comment with the thought that I think there is always going to be an essential need for core mass transit services in cities and regions like Nashville and where Nashville's going. But I think the solutions that we envisioned three years ago, five years ago, will not be the solutions that we will envision two or three years from now. I think there's going to be a lot more. Um, I, I don't know how much it'll be dependent on cars and car ownership, because car ownership is an expensive undertaking. And young people are moving away from car ownership and toward other, uh, other solutions just because they need the money for housing. Interesting. Interesting. So anyway, look, let me just, could I just emphasize one last thing? Absolutely. Vital Signs is an annual snapshot. There are is ongoing research updating what we already know. For instance, uh, mentioning Chicago. Chicago is the number one in migration location to Nashville. We get more people from Chicago than we get from anywhere, including both of the coast that are fleeing Chicago and coming to, uh, to Tennessee. I did an LA Times article or, or interview the other day. They wanted to know, A, why, is there, why are people from California coming to Tennessee? And B, what kind of a difference is it making in the, in the area to us to have Californians coming for, to Tennessee? And I told them, they're, they're great additions to the community, but we're seeing a lot of that in migration. Tra transportation, housing, infrastructure, and workforce are going to be the keys. If we want to continue to expand our prosperity, that workforce issue, matching people's skills to the jobs that are being created is the primary requirement, primary goal. Okay. So what's Ralph Schultz going to be doing over the next two or three years? Working on economic or working on workforce development. Um, we have a $25 million budget over the next five years to execute our partnership 2030 plans that execute on the priorities. Most of that investment is going to be going to working with institutions like Columbia State, like Nashville State, like the TCATs, like Motlow State, to help create programming that rapidly converts the skills of motivated, capable people to the jobs that are being created. We could go on, but we won't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Hope this was informative. It was. the. I, I think the thing that, that I took away from it, and I'm going to repeat this to uh, kind of hopefully uh, distill it all down, you know, to uh, for our audience. But again, it's all about quality of life. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we don't want our quality of life to deteriorate. We want the quality of life here to stay as good or get better than it is now. Obviously, it has to do that to attract the people that need to fill these jobs. The um, but we're going back to things like uh, affordable housing or 
affordable options anyway. Um, transportation options, access to quality education, I'm, I'm quoting from your study now. Uh, I won't dispute it. Dependable, affordable child care, access to recreation. We didn't talk about that this morning, but uh, more and more people have more and more spare time. So they're. Look, the vibe in Nashville, the vibe in this region, people are coming here for culture. They're coming here because of the culture first. It used to be other things, but it is the vibe of this city that is attracting that immigration. Well, it's uh, it's working, and uh, now that now that it's working, we've got to manage it to to make sure it uh, it stays. Can I give you one more fact? Sure. And this is an important one because Nashville has this region has always been good about managing to a balance. Um, Austin, Texas, oft quoted or oft compared to Nashville. They have 180 people a day entering their, their region, 180 people. This region has 76 people a day moving into the region. The truth of the matter is we're better off managing our growth at that rate than we are at the 180 rate. And I think that the leadership in this region is astute and thoughtful enough to realize that we want to be in the middle of the, sc of the scale, not at the far end one way or the other. That makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Just want to thank you for taking the time to come out and uh, be with us this morning. Again, Ralph Schultz, CEO and, or President and CEO of the Nashville Area Chamber, has been our guest this morning, and uh, we uh, we hope to have you back uh, as things develop over the next couple of years and, and see what uh, what's new. Love being here. Love the partnership. Williamson, Inc., we work hand in hand. Matt Largen is, uh, was with us earlier and uh, had to leave, but uh, he's, uh, I think, a good uh, manager of our, of our sis, uh, situation down here, and we appreciate all he does. I want to thank uh, Dr. Lampley and Mary Beth Challey for the hospitality we receive here at Columbia State Community College. Gina, uh, we, we appreciate you uh, being with us. Uh, Creed Henderson does an excellent job making us look good on Channel 3 and his crew, Heather and the, the other guys. Tom Lawrence over at AM 950, we appreciate all they do. Uh, Vanderbilt University, Lynn Maddox, uh, helps uh, in a financial way as well as AT&T and Dennis Wagner there. Uh, of course, the Williamson Inc. team, uh, the quarterback on this team is Kel McDowell, and uh, it takes a lot of coordination on Kel's part to make all this come together with the help of Mary Beth and all the other guys, but uh, we appreciate all you do. Uh, Nancy Conway keeps me in the know on a lot of things that are going on around the county and around the state, so appreciate all she does. Our next show will be in January. Uh, we normally uh, broadcast on the last Friday of each month. There may be an adjustment one way or the other of a week on that date, but we will be back with our legislative delegation, probably with a couple of new faces this year. Uh, in that uh, we'll also have an additional state representative and state senator representing parts of Williamson County. So we will invite them. Hopefully we'll have them with us um, in January. Um, hope you will be with us and uh, look forward to ha having everybody back. Have a good day.